Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Namaskar. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, for choosing to be underground rather than overground on a gorgeous spring afternoon. But I promise you, spring will wait, but you're in here for a very special treat that may not be repeated. It's very encouraging to see a real good mix of male and female. Every time we are planning Women's History Month programs, we always say it's not just for females. So for the males who are here, thank you. And as I said, and I repeat, you're in for a treat. Um, just for my own impression and curiosity, how many people are here for the first time? Hmm, that's almost a majority. So a very special welcome to all of you. Just a bit about our institution. The Smithsonian Institution is the world's largest museum and research complex with 19 museums and galleries and the National Zoo. The mandate of this prestigious institution is the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And to fulfill this mission, we, the staff, endeavor to inform, inspire, and educate the public through a variety of programs, exhibitions, and websites. The role of museums in our society is changing. Museums are no longer seen as the home for objects only, but increasingly viewed as venues for discussion and debate on topical issues, as a stage to present the latest, the newest, and as is true through our program today, sometimes using the performing arts. Today, museums are used as platforms to present cultural forums. Museums are increasingly being seen as tools for community representation, as well as a means for promoting cultural conservation. Today's program, part of Women's History Month celebration at the Smithsonian includes and portrays all or many of these endeavors that we try to continue here. So much has been written and debated about women's issues, women's rights, but it is never enough. There is never a last word. All the tried avenues are not enough scholars, historians, social scientists, artists, and performers from every cultural background have posed the eternal question, the role of women in society, the relationship between man, woman. Perhaps the answer lies in the yin and the yang, the belief in perfect harmony, or perhaps in the depiction of as in Ardhanariswaram, the balance, the ideal, being half man, half woman. I just love it to use a little quip now and then on this topic. A man once asked a woman, is God a man? And the woman replied, no, she is not. <laughs> Perhaps a half-truth answered by a half-truth or as is depicted in our Artha Veda, I am he, you are she. I am song, you are verse. I am heaven, you are earth. But no matter what your belief, the debate, discussion will continue forever. However, this evening, this afternoon, going into the evening, we are gathered to celebrate the woman. The woman, the international woman, in all her glories, the Nakras and the Adai. And for our program, we have a multi-talented, highly gifted woman of the 21st century. She is our Shahrazad today. Dr. Fawzia Afzal Khan, a scholar professor, playwright, poet. She has a PhD in English literature from Tufts University, and at present is a professor in the Department of English 
at Montclair State University. She is the author of numerous scholarly articles about women and Islamic culture. She is the author of Shattering the Stereotypes, Muslim Women Speak Out. Here's a copy of the book. I hope her performance can entice you into picking, it, picking up a copy. Um, I'm sure it's available on Amazon. And it's a very, very important work. Um, she, there are women from many different, Muslim American women from different, different ethnic and professional backgrounds, an important educational resource. This has been reviewed in the London Times, uh, the literary supplement, and I quote, for anyone genuinely interested in understanding the diversity of Islam, here is the mind-broadening equivalent of several books and an enticement to read still more. Fauzia has performed at the Samuel Beckett Center of Tr at Trinity College, Dublin, and most recently for NYU's prestigious post-colonial studies seminar. A part of her memoir is published in an anthology edited by Muniza Shamsis and published by Women Unlimited Press of India, and The World Changed, Contemporary Writing by Pakistani Women. Fauzia's poetry is beautiful, meaningful, and I just want to share one piece to give you a taste of her writings. I now live in upstate New York, spend part of each summer visiting the stones down on the Atlantic shore, sometimes with my son and other times alone. She's been my colleague for almost two decades in a country I now call home, although it's a palimpsest, a world my kids will never know in a way I so want them to. My son lives to hang out in the home of Harold and Carol Stone. He calls them his American grandparents. Although they have grandkids of their own, their kindness stands in for the Lahore. Of Mr. Muhammad Afzal and his wife, Rashida Banu Afzal, grandparents in absentia. In a land far away, not just as a memory, but in the here and now, of visas denied to men named Muhammad. Fauzia's done immensely important work in the field of theater. Her ongoing work on Pakistani street theater has been published in the um, Seagull publication from uh, India. It has been widely reviewed, including a review by Girish uh, Karnand. Besides all her professional acknowledgments, achievements, she plays multiple roles of wife, mother, daughter, scholar, teacher, but most of all, a wonderful human being. Before we go into the piece, Shehrazad Goes West, I'd like to share some thoughts that Fozia has asked me to convey to you, and these are in her words. What you're going to see here, experience this afternoon is neither a talk nor a performance in the traditional sense. What I have tried to do in this scholarly essay, which has undergone many transformations, is to find a way into people's minds through an experiential reality, not merely an intellectual one. The performance you will witness today is an incarnation of this complex process of communication, focusing on a topic that has created so much interest and confusion in the post 9-11 world, and particularly in the West. That topic for purposes of this talk is almost clearly delineated in the subtitle, Speaking Out as a Muslim Pakistani American Woman. 
I was unable to grasp more fully the subtexts of my own scholarly efforts, which allowed us to create a piece where the sonic and the writing and the visual realms crisscross in ways that disturb and sometimes confuse. This sound often seems patchy and the visuals bizarre. Sometimes you can see the lecture and other times you cannot. Incomprehensibility allows for deeper understanding and I think that's the key to the piece that you're going to see this afternoon. In talks, we invariably zone out of language and start seeing the voice of the speaker and I repeat, we start seeing the voice of the speaker. One hopes that in moving away from language, we come closer to comprehension. Allow yourself to sleep, yawn, wander away in your thoughts. Most importantly, just be. Please give a very warm welcome to Fozia Abzal Khan. First, having read the Book of Myths and loaded the camera and checked the edge of the knife blade, I put on the body armor of black rubber, the absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mass. This is not a question of power. You, still, whispering, touch, me, we, go, on, streaming, through, the, slow, city light, forest, ocean, during our body hair.
Did Friday in truth so much as hear me, I began to wonder. I ceased playing, and his eyes, which were always closed when he did his food playing, and his spinning did not open. I grew long blasts, and still they did not so much as flutter. So now I knew that all the time I had stood there, playing to Friday's dancing, thinking he and I made a concert. He had been insensible of me. And indeed, when I stepped forward in some peak and grasped at him to halt the infernal spinning, he seemed to feel my touch no more than if it had been flies. Tears came to my eyes. I am ashamed to say. All the elation of my discovery that through the medium of music I might at last converse with Friday was Dutch. And bitterly I began to recognize that it might not be mere dullness that kept him shut in himself, nor the accident of the loss of his tongue, nor even an incapacity to distinguish speech from battle, but a disdain for intercourse with him. Watching him whirling in his dance, I had to hold back an urge to strike him and tear the wig and robes away, and this rudely teach him he was not alone on this earth. On a staircase dark and mean, stumbling over bodies, appears the metonymic figure of the author God, Defoe Kotzea, foe to Susan, herself a foe to Friday, the latter's ripped out tongue not only signifying castration, but a metonymic excision of the female clitoris. Foe, Defoe, my foe, your foe, her foe, whose foe, meets an inscription in a tall, looping, script. Dear Mr. Foe, at last I could row no further. Foe, echoing rich in an ironic twist of gender, tells his readers. With a sigh, making the heavier splash, I slip overboard, gripped by the current, the boat bars away. Drops out to let the rain of the waves and turn the ice. Around me on the waters are the petals cast by Friday. As he delves deeper into the dark mass of the wreck, flecked here and there with white, the author figure, the speaking subject of history, discovers half buried in sand the other figure outside his story. I tightened his woody hair, but the chain about his throat. Friday, I say, I try to say, in the book, simply turns and moves into the booth. What is this shit? But, but this is not a praise of words. Each it's syllable as, as it, it comes down, it's caught and filled with water and diffuses. This is a place where bodies are their own signs. It is the home of Friday. He, he turns, turns and he turns till he lies at full length, his face to my face, his skin is tied across his bones, his lips are drawn back. I pass a finger across his teeth trying to find a way in. His mouth opens. From inside him comes a slow stream. Without breath, without interruption, it flows up through his body and out upon me. It passes through the cabin, through the wreck, washing the cliffs and shores of the island. It runs, runs northward and southward to the ends of the earth, soft and cold, dark and unending. It beats against my eyelids, against the skin of my face. I hope this long preamble allows me to ask anew the old deconstructive question posed by Spivak regarding the possibility of subaltern speech. The title of my talk enacts then 
an impossibility. The reciting of the Spivakian question, the wreck of history into which we dive, not so much to recover the forgotten remains of her story, but to come face to face with a space beyond words, a place where bodies are their own signs, where the Muslim woman cannot speak. for those who reside in the glittering glass towers of the corporate adventurers. In our case, however, our indifference is the tool, as Medea in the ancient myth is the tool of betrayal of the colonized Colchis, who is used by the conquering Jason and then cast aside. And it is we ourselves who stand to be used up and cast aside. Los Angeles and the media machine it contains of the most dominant element of its landscape has exerted a peculiarly forceful colonization of the global imagination, so powerful in fact that it has begun to displace reality itself. Media text, Los Angeles, this point shore, 2000. The production ended according to Duncan, the entire female cast, nude, wrapped head to toe in plastic like pieces of meat, who recited a fragmentary choral testimony to the commodification of culture and the pornography of the commercial imagination. A theater of global politics, one that expresses the cross-cultural struggle to grapple with sweeping new economic realities, emerging technologies of incredible power, disrupted societies, fractured traditions, became political structures, and value systems that after centuries of acceptance are increasingly called into question. Media text, Los Angeles, this Shore, 2000. When I first began working on some of Mueller's texts as an actor with a company I helped to found back in the mid-1990s, company found this airport. I struggled with the questions implicit in Duncan's valorization of Mueller. Does Mueller's work qualify as feminist, anti-colonial, anti-globalization, <coughs> transnational theater? How has Mueller's work affected a Muslim woman, a performing theorist of Pakistani alternative theater praxis, a performer observer of South Asian, Muslim, diasporic theater work, and some of the centers where the company found CFO resides? How does one's position as insider, outsider, woman, Muslim, in both first and third world contexts, inflect one's views of feminist transnational coalition possibilities of theory and praxis that would challenge this global status quo? particularly in the case of women, their labor, and representation. As far as my relationship with Mueller, it is a fairly recent one, dating to my work with the Nifan Siegel, which began in 1997, with a small production from Dia Material at the New York Fringe Festival, in which I played the role of one of several media in a production by the Pakistani-born director, Ibrahim Qureshi, documented at Lake Costa. Right away, I was alerted to the radical possibilities for change that can emerge if we really engage seriously with a vision of where our world is headed. However, as my experience with the other videos in the past showed me, Having a multicultural, multiracial cast of strong female performers did not adequately address the problems and inherent inequities that exist across the racial and class boundaries within which gender bodies and identities are located and operate. For example, 
the white media remained central to the textual version. She spoke, the rest of us were silent songstresses. The black media tried to reverse her marginality by aggressively mm. the speaking moments with her father. didn't, in my opinion, alter the politics of representation. And while Ibrahim's desire to work with Mueller's text is grounded in his vision of challenging the West's dominant paradigms of power through an engagement with its own writing text, Mueller being, after all, a Western text, with an added level of challenge coming from the fact that Mueller's high art, cerebral texts were now being staked by a man from the peripheries it is still far from clear that this other engagement with Mueller goes far enough in the direction of challenging the globalization from above paradigm. In other words, the traffic flow here, to put it mildly, is still about Western intellectual and material life experiences, dominating and dictating much of what passes even as Alan status quo challenging, multicultural, artistic work. Although obviously this type of work does open up possibilities for such challenging to occur in ways that commercial mainstream theatre work can never do. Yet, it is instructive to note the difficulty Europe's, the West's others, encounter in trying to produce work like this which is considered the prerogative of high-minded Western intellectuals by many within even the liberal, left-leaning, avant-garde circles of theatre praxis. Thus it is that our company's projects often fail to win grants from the Rockefeller or Ford Foundations or the prestigious Arts International, who often give the superficial reason that your work is too political. And frequently, what is perhaps a more insidiously liberal humanistic reason that is surmisable in such responses as, why are you doing Mueller? Why not develop a more authentic aesthetic? For instance, I was told by a theater director who read my play with some interest recently that it lacks specificity. And I was asked to make it more grounded in a concrete space, time. Perhaps he gently suggested something reflecting an authentic Muslim woman's flowing of experience. This fairly typical response encodes precisely the acute of the notion of the margin at the center of the liberal humanism that my post-colonial project seeks to displace, or rather to disperse, form. As Kalpana Sashadri quotes so perspicaciously in the lines. The energy of post-colonial studies arises from its indeterminate location and failure to recoup the margin. Post-colonial studies are concerned more with the analysis of the lived condition of unequal power sharing globally and the self-authorization of cultural, economic, and militaristic hegemony than with a particular historical phenomenon such as colonialism. It is this free-form aspect of post-colonial studies that makes it the target of both the right and the so-called left. But perhaps it is this shapelessness, this refusal to stay still, to define itself, that makes post-colonial studies a particularly hospitable interstice from which to work out the paradoxes of history and colony. The paradoxes of history and colony, within which imperialist and nationalist ideologies frame the unresolved contradiction that is human, and which these ideologies thus constantly try to tame, either by marginalization or recuperation within the center, 
this contradictory space of woman must, for my project, remain an irrecuperable one within the reigning discourses of our times. A visible marker of the very untenability of the concept of margin, of other, of a woman as other, as mother of others. It is post 9-11 work. It is the post 9-11 world, after all. But the question that I really wanted the text to ask was, who precisely are the barbarians? And why have they arrived at the shores of civilization? Whose civilization? <coughs> One of the most ironic answers that our text provides to this constellation of questions is that Mueller has transformed into Mueller Mueller himself might have appreciated. Mad Medea, I sued him this conversion of Medea, let's just say, a Medea who is a mystic, a dancer at shrines of local Muslim saints, whose devotional cults are frowned upon as un-Islamic by the orthodox elite, hails from <laughs> in the absence of responsible state actors. The 
young here is that they're funding sources like general agencies like the IMF and the World Bank, who are movers and shakers of capital and the dreaded enforcers of structural adjustment programs, which render the poor and disenfranchised more impotent and debt ridden than ever before. The NGO worker are the character who undergoes several guises in the course of the play is a believer. So it would appear. In transnational agencies, the ability to empower working class third world women. But Man Medea, an avatar of the famous Shehrazad of the Iranian race, implicated within the class system of this patriarchal world order that we inhabit is nevertheless not one to be fooled by such new seductions and seducers. She has seen it all before and in turn implicates her many seducers as sources fueling, even propelling her desire for vengeance. When the first dramatic reading of my play was performed by some members of Company Fantasy Echo in the fall of 2002 at the Asian American Writers Workshop in Manhattan, Nula Mullah was substituted with Muhammad, and we chose to have a male speaker split the role of Medea with two women, myself covered in a chador and recited some of the text in Urdu translation. And Vero, my French counterpart, emerging naked from a tubular cloth sculpture. Thus, Ibrahim, in a Palestinian cafe, kept shouting lines that our audience recognized as part of our post 9 11 discursive habitat, trying to unsuccessfully drown me and Vero out. Jason's Lahore, come to court chase, to London, to New York. Where is he? My husband, my creator. Cover that slut, Shador suits, beats and doll, debating the fate of one who sits alone. Framed in the corner on a ripped up bed, her sister's silence standing her to whoredom in the factory of slaves. So to recite my questions and concerns, who am I, where am I? What could constitute an effective interruptive feminist performance report, reverse, and challenge the imperialist patriarchal performances of globalized power and dominance and their postmodern capitalist permutations masquerading as a new world order. In my performative identity as Muslim, South Asian, other, woman, how far can I really go? I'm permitted to go, to jam the machinery, to interrupt business as usual. I conclude with my script's cautionary tale. For being Eula's faithful maid, Medea, like him, I must perform my mea culpa in this transnational game we play.
And that was a fabulous museum. <coughs> Can we all give her a big round of applause? I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, comments, observations. And Fozia will be here with Mustafa Sandani, the technical director. Mustafa, please come up. This program has been more than six months in the making, and there is a whole team came together to make this possible. I'd like to convey my thanks to Stevie Engelke for her belief and encouragement. Our director, uh, Stephanie Norby, who's here with us, and I'm sure we'll be talking about all of this for a long time to come and the entire team, we kept calling it the Shehrazad team. Philippa Rappaport, thanks Philippa. Christina, she's all the way here from Utah. Her exhibition with all those paintings at the Hirshhorn Museum a few years ago. And Fozia. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to actually thank you very much for taking the lead and inviting me here and giving me the opportunity in, perform in uh, this wonderful space, such a prestigious space, and I'm very glad that we were able to pull it off, and I know that you have worked particularly hard in your team as well, and uh, I do appreciate it very, very much. 
Um, <clears throat> this piece has been uh, in the making for uh, several years, and it was written originally as uh, a, you know, a critical, a theoretical essay, um, which also tries to talk about the play that the script that I had written called Shed Art Going With, which I, uh, you know, the title, which I took and was suggested to me by a very powerful, wonderful book by a partner of my niece, who is an Indian Islamic theologian. Um, and she had been, and I was reading it shortly after 9 11, and it sort of got me all very excited. And I wrote this script, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of very drawn to non linear narratives and uh, sort of, um, you know, complex um, uh, sort of experimental, uh, you know. Um, work both in terms of my writing and as well as performance. And I've been involved with a company called Company Fantasy Echo, which uh, <clears throat> does a lot of experimental work uh, around the kinds of issues that you saw today. And, and um, while we were working on the last production, Five Streams for Asia Society, I also met Mustafa Sandani, who sits to my right, who is a graduate of um, the master's program at, in performance studies from Brown. and I. Uh, when he saw me read this, and it's, as I said, done differently, I had I'd read it and I added bits of live performance, but never quite like what you saw here today. And um, so that incarnation and the visuals and all of that work is really most of us. So definitely we should give him another round of applause. <laughs> and I think he would really like, I mean, it would be very useful. I'm afraid that I forgot um, to bring um, Questionnaires that we have prepared to get some feedback and to see what works for you, what does not work, what your reactions are, both you know in terms of, of the aesthetics or the the thought of the piece. Um, so please feel free to say whatever is on your mind. Nothing will be taken remiss. It is a work in progress. It's been a work in progress for a long time and it just keeps changing. So I'm very excited to have been able to do this. But we are open for discussion. And Mustafa, if you wanted to say anything, I don't know. Well, I mean, is there any questions? Yeah, we'll take so we'll take. Um, We'd like to go that way. And they can also just be a sharing of your reactions, whatever the excuse me may be. Well, I, I mean, I, I can give you a bit of an intro into like what I'm trying to do. Um, I actually left the PhD program to direct, uh, and what I'm primarily working with is uh, lines of movement. And for me, the starting point for any conceptual work is architecture. So uh, when we did it the last time, we did it in a space where there was an eye in the middle. Um, and that's how Fozio actually comes to the stage. But for me, primarily, the first thing that I'm trying to disassemble is the proscenium stage. Um, I find, I mean, my own training has been in conventional theater. But what I'm trying to first sort of undo um, is the proscenium, uh, linear narrative, um, the idea that a play is has a starting point and an ending point, and all of that I'm trying to do away with, and primarily work with icons, and in this case, for instance, today you saw there was the knife, the book, and the camera, and, uh, and also teasing the audience into going places where they don't go by themselves. So I'm prim primarily trying to not feed you an idea, but create an experience. So, and my primary focus is rituals, and that's what I was sort of studying in school as well. And my own background and upbringing has been in a very Sufi mystical uh, tradition. And what I'm basically in my work trying to create are shrines. And uh, the idea that you can be in sacred space, and even if nothing is happening as such, which you might have seen today, that you're like, nothing really happened. But it's presence that um, I'm trying to do with this course. Okay, we'll open it up. Are there any questions? <coughs> yes. So, would you talk a little bit more? What was that space you were trying to get us to with this, the whole thing? Well, it was primarily uh, the idea that here is a female. Um, the talk obviously was about the Muslim woman and her voice, and you actually don't get to hear her voice. So, it's that energy or that gap. Now, it, it's not like a specific idea that I want you to go to, but just experiencing that, and then whatever idea or however you react to it. So just like in any sacred space, I think when people visit a sacred space, they take out of it what's within them. So it's not like, uh, it's not like a didactic thing. And that's why I wanted to make this not a lecture. 
Because when you go to a lecture, you are told what to think, or you're specifically sort of taken by the hand to wherever the speaker's trying to take you. But over here, there was no like one place. It was just this idea that there's, there's the female, even when she takes her burqa off, you don't see her face. Yeah, I mean, there's I really actually want to ask people, I'm sort of going to interrupt you there, because I think it's sort of interesting to get their reactions rather than tell them <laughs> what their reactions should be. So I'm very curious what you thought of the different iconic images of this figure as she moves about in the space or doesn't, doesn't sort of just move very much, juxtaposed with all the other elements. Somebody else. Does anyone, that's the feature of me, I'm sorry, I want to just point here. A little louder, please, so everyone can hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. quite intentional. But I'm curious what, you know, so, I mean, it's very interesting to be in a space